mee naar een stoeplijst. Nou, there are many of such examples that when you do that, you begin to overexpress individual repair genes. Effect is actually negative or the effect is zero. You can understand why that is. Again, I said, there is nothing like one DNA repair gene. There are many of them and their activity can vary depending on the organ or tissue. It can vary depending on the age level. It can vary lots of things, environment, whatever it is. So that's not going to help you do it. What we need is a master regulator some sort of uh, magical gene that is going to control all these repair processes. So if you can manipulate that master controller, then DNA repair will become better or worse, of course. Now, very recently, evidence had emerged that that is actually the case. We, we have something like that. I, I sort of say that because I just got an email from uh, from work where we got some uh, results showing that that actually may be the case. I will come back to that in a second. Now, there's a complex which was discovered a couple of years ago, and it was discovered not because it had, it had anything to do with DNA repair, but it was involved in cell cycle, which is also re relevant for DNA repair. So it can control if cells are cycling, so dividing, or when they are not doing that. Now, we call that, that's a very complex, uh, big complex of proteins. We call it the DREAM complex. It's an abbreviation, D-R-E-A-M, but we call it obviously DREAM. It's a beautiful name. So now one of my good friends and, and collaborators in Germany, Bjorn Schumacher, published a paper uh, in one of the Nature journals uh, a year or two ago, where he showed that that dream complex in worms, he, he, worms is his favorite model organism, when he is basically uh, inhibiting that complex, then the repair processes are going up, they are increased. He sees that the expression level of many different DNA repair enzymes is now going up, increasing in tune. They're all just doing the same thing. So it seemed that DREAM is sort of a master regulator here. Now, he also looked at the germline. Now, in germ cells, DREAM is not active. It doesn't work. So that seemed like strange, but it isn't. When, dr when DREAM is off, you have very good DNA repair. So germ cells are known to have very good DNA repair. Now, we compare the mutation rate in the germline in comparison to stem cells, in comparison to differentiated cells. The highest mutation rate was found in differentiated cells. In the stem cells, we have not published that yet, well, a little bit in, in liver, we see lower mutation rate in stem cells. In germ cells, the lowest. There's still mutations, but of course, we know there are mutations in germ cells. That's how evolution works, not? but it's about 10 to 100 fold less than in different cells. Now you can sort of imagine why that could be, not? We, we cannot have too, too many mutations in the germline because otherwise the species will become extinct. So the germ cells must be protected very aggressively and they are. And dream is off. So we can conclude then when dream is off, that's good. But we know that in different cells, dream is on. I, I, I all the time simplify here a little bit, so, yeah. but I have to do that. Now, what happens now if you then, as, he, as Bjorn did in the nematode cells, when he begins to inhibit dream in the difference in the cells. So he makes the difference in the cells a little bit more like germ cells. He sees DNA repairs going up. So the, the difference in the cells, the normal somatic cells, become more like germ cells. So they have a better repair. And he now knows also, I don't think he has published it, but I'm... I'm sure he will not be angry with me when I tell you that he did find that these worms now are indeed longer lived. It's a worm, so it's very difficult to uh, extrapolate to the human, but nevertheless. Now, we work very closely with him. So our reasoning is this. When he, he now made a mouse model, by the way. In the mouse model, he switched off dream. So this is a mouse now, and the mouse is normal, apparently. It's born normal, and it's still young now, but he shows that he has tissues and uh, dream is off, doesn't work. So it should have better repair. So now he sent us, he has sent us tissues and asked us to look for mutations. Can we now show that in those dream off mice, the mutation rate is indeed lower than in the 
normal control mice dream on. And I just told you, I got this email this morning that our first results, and again, these are sort of, actually they're not really first results, they're second results. We always do a pilot first and then show it. And we do see indeed a small uh, reduction, which is very clear in the mutation rate when, we, when he in the mouse inhibits dream. Here there's clear evidence that inhibiting dream is increasing all your repair processes and apparently also reducing, albeit only by a little, mutation frequency. Are we the only ones who found this? No, there is actually a paper, we just found that actually on, uh, uh, well, Bjorn sent it to us, on, uh, uh, by Trey Eidecker, also in a mouse model, a different mouse model, and it's on bioarchive, so it hasn't been uh, published yet, but it's publicly available. And he also finds a very small decline in the mutation rate. So since these are already two independent groups, okay, neither has been peer reviewed yet, but we find that completely independent of each other in different mouse models. So to me, I'm very excited about it. I don't say it's all true, we still need to confirm, but I'm very excited about the possibilities that we may play tinker with dream in the somatic cells and then maybe uh, not only increase DNA repair, but reduce mutation burden. Do we know what dream does and does turning it off have any negative impact? Wow, that's of course the good question. When uh, Bjorn made uh, his mouse model, he was even expecting that they wouldn't survive. They wouldn't be born alive, but they did. And they seem to be completely normal. Now, why is that? Well, as you as is usually in the, this kind of processes, uh, this is very complex. There may be lots of factors that in some way control cell cycling, cell division, and DNA repair. And the fact that we, well, I told you we have a the effect is really small. So it's like maybe ten percent. It's maybe ten percent lower, 10, 20 percent maybe. So we we could clearly measure it. It's significant, but it is small. So we don't really know uh, how important that will prove to be for life. In, in worms, apparently it is, but could it be also in the mouse? Will his mice live longer? You know, this is all very exciting stuff. So, uh, so, so you called us at, at, in exactly the right moment because I've never been so excited about this. Because when you asked me this maybe five years ago, I would tell you no. I would say uh, if aging is truly caused by somatic mutations, then that's it. We can never fix that. It's not possible. And we will basically uh, always are, remain stuck at our maximum lifespan. Uh, I mean, I don't know. You may be aware of the fact that we published a paper in Nature in, uh, in 2000, uh, 2016, I believe. Yeah, 2016, uh, where we basically argued that uh, human lifespan has a natural limit of about 115 years. And we basically derived that from demographic studies on uh, on existing data sets. And there was an enormous uh, uh, conversation about that. <laughs> but a lot of people were very disappointed. They couldn't believe it because they were so optimistic that we can, could begin to increase human lifespan because there's so much talk about geroscience and everything. And now we sort of threw a bucket of cold water over there by saying, well, forget it because this is it. I mean, there's absolutely zero evidence that uh, we have improved human maximum lifespan. Yes, we improved uh, mean lifespan. Obviously, we did. People have much more chance now to grow old and stay healthy than in the past. And maybe we can still uh, improve on that, although even I, I have my doubts about that too. But, uh, but definitely, we cannot break through the limit. Now, okay, to some extent, that's also premature, of course, because you never know what will be discovered tomorrow or next year or in 10 years. But but for me, it was seemed pretty convincing that the only way to tinker with with aging itself is by going to the baseline processes, the basic mechanisms. And as you and I discussed now for a long time already, this could be DNA damage and mutations. And if you can slow that down, yeah, then you could probably bring that limit to life up to maybe, I don't know, 130, 150, where's the limit? We don't know that. That's obviously the... the well, the pot of gold, not at the end of the rainbow. When, when we are able to understand what the basic mechanisms of aging are and we can play with it, 
look, then in a way the sky's the limit and we are really getting very close to what the old alchemists wanted to accomplish, not to gain immortality. Now, again, I'm not the type to argument. People, most of my colleagues feel that I'm always too negative about uh, about aging. That's why they're a little bit worried when I'm going to talk because, well, they think, oh my God, here again, this guy, you know, is going to say that he cannot live much longer than that and, and uh, aging is too complex, too difficult. Yeah, but still, I mean, I I would be the first to uh, to say, look, let's explore this because maybe we are able to do it. And then there are many other questions that you can ask. Is it desirable to do a thing like that? Ethically, we don't know. So thinking about these, so there's all these uh, processes, the, the genes that help with the repair. So... I, I mean, I believe that the PARPs and the Sirtuins are some of these, are, are two genes that help with DNA repair. Yes. So just would you think that taking an NAD booster, which PARPs and Sirtuins both need NAD boost, NAD, mm. would, that, would that speed up their, would that increase their activity? And would increasing their activity make any difference to the DNA repair? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. Uh, now you you probably know uh, that uh, NAD boosters uh, they didn't get a good rap recently, mm -hmm. but that's almost true for everything. So let's be fair. I mean, anything you come up with, there are always uh, people who criticize it. And uh, and uh, although I may have a name to be pessimistic about these things and always negative, I'm actually usually positive. I I feel that we need to explore this further. Now, can NAD boosters influence uh, the sirtuins can they boost activity of CRT6 uh, and CRT1 well I, I don't know I honestly don't and it's not my field but I do know uh, and my friend and colleague Vera Gorbinova showed that very clearly that CRT6 is involved in double strand break repair and I mentioned before already how important that is so it could be that CT6 actually is a master regulator, call it a mini master regulator, a master regulator of only double strand break repair. Is it? We still don't know. But she found very clearly that long-lived species, they have better double strand break repair and higher levels of CT6. So here is, a, here is another correlation. So that tells you that, yes, that certainly is an avenue that may be worth following. And sirtuins, known as some sort of longevity genes, could certainly, if we study that the right way in depth, could maybe one mechanism to improve DNA repair uh, and maybe also uh, increase lifespan. Is that likely? I still think not, because there are too many other DNA, pathway, DNA repair pathways that are not affected by it, and and they may then become the limiting factor. I mean, it's always the case. Not you. You take one one uh, possible cause away, but then there are too many others that are still there, and they eventually you will end up to gain nothing. Now, potentially, that that's the danger also with what I just said about dream. Theoretically, we could maybe influence all DNA repair processes and slow down all DNA damage and mutations. Now, will that then extend lifespan significantly? Well, it has certainly the potential to do that, but that would imply that there are no other aging processes independent of DNA damage. And is that likely? No. Think about it this way. Suppose now that DNA repair, DNA damage would be the original cause of aging in all species. It would be a universal cause. Then evolution would anticipate on that simply by saying, well, it doesn't talk, of course, but the way I behave now, like I'm evolution, you know, it is how evolution works, not it selects for things that have effects. It would say, well, if we select for something that let that person live much longer than its mutation rate allows, what's the usefulness? Because the person will be dead. So evolution would never select for something beneficial that would appear later than when after your death. It wouldn't do that. So then, it, but it was also the other way around. When there are, are adverse effects and there would be uh, some gene that is doing bad things late in life or 
So after you normally all would already have died, evolution would do nothing. It would let it st sit in. So it means that even if you would neutralize mutations as a cause of aging, there will be a whole bunch of other processes independent of mutations that were not selected against by evolution. They are sticking your genome. So now you will need to address those processes too. The only hope you can have is that those processes can fairly easily be fixed while DNA damage cannot. So when we can fix DNA damage, we may go to all the other causes and they may be relatively simple. We, we don't know if I'm speculating, but it is a possibility.